Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your day to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. So I'm finally going to talk about this. So many of you, especially in the last year, have suggested this case to me, so thank you in advance if you were one of those individuals. The Dardine family murders are horrific and to this day remain unsolved. So as always, I invite you to join me as we remember the Dardine family. Russell Keith Dardine was born on June 22, 1958 in Mount Carmel, Illinois, and his wife, Ruby Elaine Dardine, was born August 10, 1957 in Fairfield, Illinois. The pair married in August of 1979 and moved to Evansville, Indiana, where they lived until their son, Peter Sean Dardine, was born on July 5, 1984. Both Russell and Ruby chose to go by their middle names, Keith and Elaine. In 1986, Keith took a job at the Rend Lake Water Conservancy District as a treatment plant operator in Ina, Illinois. Ina is a small hamlet that covers around 2.4 square miles and is nestled in Jefferson County. In 2021, it boasted a population of about 1,600 individuals, a number that was even less in the 1980s. Ina was rather quiet with no real criminal cases happening for nearly 60 years. Before moving his family with him, Keith decided to get things set in place by purchasing a mobile home and renting land from a nearby farmer. After completing his training for his new position and getting adjusted, Elaine and Peter moved into their new home in Ina. Shortly after her arrival, Elaine found work as a secretary at the Davenport Office Supply in Mount Vernon, Illinois. The Dardines were hardworking and described as two of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. They were very loving, caring, and devoted parents. When they weren't at work, the Dardines spent their free time attending the Baptist Church, where they participated in the church's musical ensemble, with Keith on vocals and Elaine on the piano. The Dardines were settling into their new life well, and had a lot to look forward to since Elaine discovered she was expecting the couple's second child in 1987. If it were a boy, they planned to call him Ian. If it were a girl, Casey. Despite the stereotypes that accompany small-town living, Keith felt Ina was becoming too violent for his growing family. In 1987, Jefferson County and nearby Franklin County had a significant increase in homicides and violent crimes, leaving the residents, especially those in rural locations, stressed, and the Dardines were no different. Keith became very protective of his family, even allegedly turning away a teenage girl who asked to use their phone one night. Keith confessed to his mother Joanne on numerous occasions of his wishes to move his family back home to Mount Carmel. Not only did he want to be closer to his parents, but he also wanted to provide a safe environment. Without even a plan really, Keith decided to place the mobile home he purchased the year prior on the market and started to look for work back home. He was determined to leave Ina. Joanne claimed her son often regretted moving in the first place. Joanne was no stranger to the violent crimes in and around the area her son lived, since she and Keith had a mutual interest in true crime stories. However, she never imagined her family would fall victim to one. On November 18, 1987, Keith didn't show up for his shift, which caused raised eyebrows amongst his supervisors. It was unlike Keith to not come into work, especially without even calling to let them know he wasn't going to make it in. His supervisor attempted to call Keith's home phone, but there was no answer. He then phoned Keith's mother and father. His parents also tried to call the home, but again got no answer. The panic set in because Keith wouldn't just disappear, so they called the sheriff's office to perform a welfare check. Keith's father, Don, offered to meet up with the responding officer, bringing along his spare key. Don and the officer arrived at the home around 6.30 p.m. that same day. The family's car, a red 1981 Plymouth was gone. Police knocked on the door several times where no response was received, so Don let them in. The officer entered the home guided by the beam of his flashlight. The home was dark and silent, and nothing seemed to be out of place. However, walking into the master bedroom, a gruesome scene was discovered. Tucked away into the bed were the bodies of Elaine, Peter, and a newborn baby girl. 
Elaine was bound by duct tape and gagged. The children were not. It was discovered Elaine, who was 30 at the time, suffered blows to the right top of her head, which resulted in a fractured skull. Peter, who was three, suffered numerous abrasions and contusions, and his skull was also fractured. As briefly mentioned, the body of a newborn baby was found amongst Peter and Elaine. Elaine's attack was so brutal it resulted in early labor. She was around seven months pregnant at the time. Casey Elaine Dardine was born November 17, 1987, and sadly passed moments later. The Dardine's attacker showed no mercy to Casey either. The murder weapon, a baseball bat, was found propped outside of the bedroom. The baseball bat was previously gifted to Peter by his father for his birthday. The home didn't appear to be a crime scene beyond the bedroom. In fact, it appeared the attacker chose to stay behind and clean up, indicating they were in no hurry to leave. During the search of the home, Keith Dardine was nowhere to be found, and despite his parents' reassurance that their son would never hurt his family, he became the investigator's primary focus. An APB was placed for both Keith and the family car. Suspicions quickly faded, though. The following day, a group of hunters found the body of Keith Dardine in a wheat field not far from the mobile home. Unlike his family, Keith was shot a total of three times. Once in the frontal skull, on the right side of his face, and lastly on his left cheek. It was also discovered Keith was castrated, but they were unable to determine if it was a post-mortem action or not. The coroner had difficulty establishing the exact time of death for the Dardines. He could only determine that Keith was likely the last victim, and he was killed within an hour or two of his family. Hours after the discovery of Keith, the family's car was found abandoned outside of a police station in the nearby town of Benton. The police station was about 11 miles from the Dardine home. Blood was found on the interior of the car, leading investigators to speculate that Keith might have spent his final moments here. With all victims accounted for, the big question plagued the minds of those involved. Who murdered the Dardine family? Nearly 100 people were interviewed in relation to the case, and it got police no closer to an answer. No one had anything bad to say about the family, which made establishing a motive difficult. Cataloging the scene also provided more questions than answers. It was discovered the back door was left unlocked, and there was no signs of forced entry. Keith's parents didn't find anything to be missing, and police stated there was no evidence that robbery was the reason, since valuables such as a VCR, a portable camera, cash, and jewelry were in plain sight and easily accessible. Marijuana was found inside of the house, but the quantity didn't lead authorities to believe that the Dardines were drug dealers. In fact, Joanne suggested it might have belonged to the killer, since she didn't think Keith or Elaine partook. The brutal nature of the killings led some of the investigators to think that it could have been a sacrificial ritual by a cult. But again, the lack of evidence, such as known symbolism, was not found at the scene. One of the officers found a stack of papers with sports scores inside the home and thought maybe Keith had a gambling problem. But Joanne quickly shot that down, stating her son was very frugal. The Dardines definitely didn't live beyond their means. They had typical debt that most households had, such as a mortgage and a car loan. Keith and Elaine did not have a criminal past. Every possible motive was explored, including an affair, but no known evidence was found to show either Elaine or Keith were unfaithful. Investigators didn't feel like the murders were committed randomly. They didn't feel it was a passerby due to the nature of the crime. They did, however, think the Dardines could have been chosen by mistake. News of the murders quickly spread throughout Ina, which only escalated an already uneasy community, with many residents open carrying their shotguns for protection. The locals also became frightened to help strangers or let them into their homes. Oftentimes, if someone ran into trouble on the country back roads, they wouldn't travel to a nearby home. They would head straight to the highway for assistance. The limited information about the Dardines case caused the spread of rumors and speculation, which often contradicted the known facts. Even with the local police teaming up with Illinois State Police and launching a massive investigation involving 30 full-time detectives on the case, 
they still hit a dead end. Without much to go on, the leads dried up quickly, and with no motive established, the case started to go cold. Joanne Dardine continued to pressure authorities to solve the case and tried her best to push the case beyond the local news. She petitioned to have the case featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show by gathering more than 3,000 signatures, but sadly, she was turned down by the show because the nature of the murders was deemed too graphic for daytime television. She also tried America's Most Wanted, who also rejected covering the case. They did feature the case later in 1998, but it generated no new leads. The lack of national coverage had a detrimental impact on solving the murders, since no new tips were being brought in. Joanne offered a few possibilities, suggesting that maybe someone liked Elaine and she rejected their advances. She also felt that someone wanted Keith to sell drugs, but he refused. However, none of these angles could be proven. It wasn't until 2000 that a suspect would finally be named in the case. Serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells started confessing up to 70 murders he committed throughout the country, with one of these crimes being that of the Dardeen family. Investigators didn't even know who Sells was prior to his confession. Sells grew up in southeast Missouri. He stated he had a very rough childhood growing up. By the age of seven, he was drinking. Then, by eight, he was assaulted by a family member. Then, by the age of 10, he turned to experimenting with drugs. And, by 13, he stated he attempted to assault his own mother. Sell's family moved away without telling him the following year. And with no supervision, Sells allegedly took his first life at 15 years old. By the time he'd reached his 20s, Sells stated he was a heavy drinker and he wasn't doing much in life so he opted to travel the country as a carnival worker. In June of 2000, he was arrested near Del Rio, Texas for the murder of Kayleen Harris, aged 13, and attempted murder of Crystal Searles, aged 10. Crystal thankfully survived the attack and was able to provide details to create a composite sketch, which ultimately led to his arrest. When asked how Sells came to know the Dardines, he claimed he met Keith at a truck stop or a pool hall, where Keith invited him back to his house for dinner. Once back at their home, Sells claimed Keith and Elaine propositioned him, which sent him into a fit of rage. He took Keith by gunpoint where he left his body in the field, then drove back to the home to take care of Elaine and Peter. However, a big issue with Sells was he often changed his story and embellished his retellings. In another interview regarding the Dardines, Sells recanted his previous statement on how he met Keith, stating the first response was meant to be a curveball to steer police from the real reason he wound up at the trailer, organized crime. Sells claimed that he saw the mobile home for sale, and he planned to use this as a way to gain entry to Keith, so he waited in the nearby woods for a perfect opportunity. At the time, federal prosecutors conducted a large drug conspiracy trial at the courthouse, and Sells claimed someone connected Keith to the drug conspiracy. Sells didn't provide how, but it eventually involved him, and he claimed, quote, When you step in the ballpark, you better be ready to play. You bring yourself down, your wife, even your kids. He's lucky it stopped at his family, end quote. Although Sells claimed that he was hired to take out Keith due to his involvement with the drug conspiracy, none of it could actually be proven. None of his statements matched the known evidence, and the information he did provide correctly could have easily been gotten from the media. During interviews, he was asked several things about the scene that was not released to the public, such as the position Elaine's body was found in. He initially answered incorrectly, but guessed correctly the second time. Sells offered to go to Ina and walk police through the scene, but since he was already on death row in Texas, state laws forbid these prisoners from being removed. The more Sells was interviewed, the more unreliable he became. But then he blurted out one unknown detail found at the scene. Sells described a set of watermelon ceramics found inside of the Dardine home. And for Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, this was enough to prove that Sells had been at the scene. This was a detail only the family and investigators knew, and Sells delivered the information unprompted, so they kept listening to him. 
Bill Clutter of Investigating Innocence was granted interviews with Sells as a means of investigating other cases that might be linked to Sells, and during his interview, he mentioned the Dardines. Sells claimed the victims were targeted and he watched and waited for them. Clutter stated, quote, I believe he went into the trailer and took control of Ruby and three-year-old son, duct taped their hands, and waited for Keith to come home, end quote. Clutter, along with the investigators, believed the ceramic detail proved he was the killer, and they were so positive they were ready to call the case closed. However, the Jefferson County State's attorney declined to press charges. After considering all of the evidence, they stated Sells had too many inconsistencies between what he claimed and what was known as fact in the case. When Sells first confessed, Joanne stated she was 99% sure he was responsible. She only had a little bit of doubt, not that he didn't do it, but he maybe didn't act alone. Joanne hoped to meet with Sells face to face. She felt if she could just talk to him, she would be convinced 100% and be able to let it go. But Joanne never got to speak to him. As the years passed, her convictions about Sells waned, and by the time he died, she doubted he had anything to do with her family's death. Although Sells confessed to 70 murders, he was only connected to 22 of his alleged killings, and the Dardines were not one of them. Sells was originally due to be executed in May 2006, but a stay of execution put the date on hold due to a question regarding his mental capacity. His appeal was rejected by a higher court and his new execution date was set for April 3, 2014 and was carried out at the Texas State Penitentiary. Prior to Detective Captain Scott Burge of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department's retirement, he stated the Dardeen's investigation was ongoing. He claimed, quote, It feels like it moves slow to me, even I want to know much more about the case. It takes time for me to get through. There's actually 21 four-inch binders completely full just on the case, end quote. It is unclear if any new leads or previous evidence has been retested with new technology. Joanne Dardine continues the crusade for justice for her family by trying to keep the case in the public eye. Keith, Elaine, Peter, and Casey Dardine were laid to rest at the Graceland Cemetery in Albin, Illinois. Their case remains unsolved. If you or anyone you know has information on who killed the Dardine family, please contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office or the Jefferson County Crime Stoppers. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. I know the Dardine case has been covered a lot on YouTube, but there hasn't really been recent videos and I feel like every bit helps to keep it current, so maybe one day there will be some kind of progress and closure for their family. I also want to mention that all of those resources for contacting the tip lines and things are in the description of the video as the usual of my unsolved cases, so if you need those resources, they will be there. But I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so share them below and we can chat about this. If you found this video to be informative, please consider leaving a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. So I'm kind of curious as to what type of cases you all would like to see featured in future uploads. Let me know in the comments or your preferred method of contact. But I hope you guys all have an awesome week ahead of you. And I thank you for your kind words and your support. Don't forget, you are all the best. And as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.